Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers. And in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. We meet you wherever you are in the world. Also here in my native Caribbean island of Trinidad and over there in Tobago. Uh, with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be with you. And in this blessed month of Ramadan, we greet you with Ramadan Mubarak. We uh, We want to begin today with a, um, a special surprise uh, for one of my friends. Uh, he's a Hindu friend of mine. And uh, we went to my electrician with my motor car. You know, the horn was uh, sometimes it would blow, sometimes it wouldn't blow. And I went to my electrician, who is a Hindu friend of mine, Mr. I hope he doesn't mind my mentioning his name, uh, Mr. Manilal, and, uh, and uh, I had gone after several, a few years perhaps, and uh, he was so happy to meet me, and he said to me, Molana, I listen to your programs every Sunday morning. So I am honored, uh, uh, Mr. Manilal, I greet you this morning with good morning, and I'm honored to have you in my viewing audience. Uh, we break for a moment uh, because we have some uh, uh, sponsors. And Nisa Fashions, for a wide selection of Islamic clothing for men, women, and children. And Nisa Fashions is the place to be. Choose from our perfumes, watches, jewelry, and clothing. Accessories in a variety of styles and colors. Islamic books and beautiful gift items. Visit An Nisa Fashions today, 18 Naparima Road, Kokia Village, San Fernando. Opposite the Public Service Credit Union near Kokia Roundabout, 653-6011, 704-6042. Yeah, sorry for that break, and uh, we uh, greet you, not only my friend Mr. Manilal, but all the others here uh, in this blessed month of Ramadan with uh, Ramadan Kareem. Allahu Akram is the answer. Uh, before we uh, commence our lecture today, let me make this announcement that I will give a public lecture uh, at the Barakpur Islamic Center. Uh, it is going to be almost sub to Saturday. Uh, July the 8th, and uh, at the time of Salatul Maghrib. And uh, the topic will be uh, an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world. It's a very, very, very important subject. And you wouldn't want to be ignorant on this subject. You'd want to know, have some knowledge of this subject because it's dealt with in the Quran, not just the Hadith, the Quran. So Barakpur, Islamic Center. I think the Urdu pronunciation will be Barakpur, but we here we call it Barakpur. And that is uh, Saturday Yawm Musabt 
and July 8 at the time of Maghrib. And the topic would be an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world. I hope we can get a projector and have a screen so I can have some geographical images put on the screen for you to help you. And then a reminder about the seminar in Geneva for those of you who are in Europe. And listening to me, that uh, we'll have a seminar in Geneva at the Self Sabir restaurant on, again, Yom Sabto, Saturday, July the 29th. And uh, it's at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and the topic is an Islamic response to Dajjal's digital and electronic monetary system, a subject which is right at the front, the most important subject at this particular time. Um, there will be no... Lect no IBN lecture next week, next uh, Yawm al-Ahad, next Sunday, uh, because we'll probably be celebrating Eid al-Fitr. So if I don't see you, uh, let me greet you Eid Mubarak uh, today. Uh, in the Arab world, they greet each other with Kullu Sana Anta Tayyib, Kullu Aam Wa Antum Bikhair, and here in Trinidad, Eid Mubarak. Uh, these lectures are, can be viewed live uh, on YouTube, um, at the uh, IBN Master. It will be done at the bottom of the screen. IBN Master, you can see the lectures live uh, on YouTube. Now then, on the last occasion, we, uh, we were looking at the importance of the moment when Allah sent down the revelation uh, instituting the fast of Ramadan. And uh, if I recall correctly, we pointed out that the fast of Ramadan, this revelation was there in the Sama'a Dunya, waiting to come down from the lowest uh, uh, parallel universe, the Sama'a Dunya, waiting to be brought down. But Allah kept it there for 13 years in Mecca. He never sent it down. And then for 17 months in Medina, he never sent it down. He only sent it down at that moment in time when it had a strategic role to play. And what was that moment in time? When the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, the last of all the Prophets of Allah, arrived in Medina, uh, there was a very large and significant community of Jews. There were the Rabbis, I said they were the, the creme de la creme, the, the intellectual elite of the Jewish world was there in Medina. Why were they there? They were there because they did not accept Jesus, Nabi Isa Islam, as the Messiah. No, they rejected him. And they were expecting the Messiah to come. And they, they knew that someone was coming in Medina. That's why they were there. And they thought it was going to be the Messiah. No. It wasn't the Messiah. It was someone else. It was the Prophet of Allah. They were expecting someone to come, and he came. When he arrived, it was the most critical moment in Jewish history. I hope you Jews are listening to me. This is the, crit the most critical moment in your history. When Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, arrived in that city in which you were located. He prayed in the, alert, in the direction in which you prayed, Jerusalem. And I said that this was evidence as dazzling as the sunshine. This man could not be other than a prophet of the one God, as he said he was. Because in order to, to face Jerusalem in prayer, he had to turn his back on Mecca, the Kaaba. And the entire Arab world venerated the Kaaba as the spiritual capital of the world. So for an Arab to turn his back to the Kaaba and turn instead to Jerusalem was impossible, and yet he did it. So this was evidence as dazzling as the sunshine. This man could not have been other than a prophet of the one God, like unto Moses, Nabi Musa alayhi salam. Like unto Abraham, Nabi Ibrahim, alayhi salam. But he did more than that. We, we recall he fasted with the Jews. On the days when they fasted, and in accordance with the law of fasting in the Torah. What was that law? That law was no food, no drink, 
no sexual relation, no sexual intercourse from sunset to sunset for 24 hours. And that's how he fasted. When he fasted with the Jews in that way, in accordance with their law of fasting, as no Arab had ever fasted before in history, there was evidence as dazzling as the sunshine, this man could not have been other than the prophet of the one God, as he claimed he was. And then we pointed out one thing else, one more thing, that they attempted to test him. And they brought two people who had committed adultery and who confessed about it. Muhammad, alayhi salam, you judge, alayhi salatu wasalam. And then he said, oh, you bring your book. And they, what do you, what punishment do you give? And they said, well, we make their faces black and we beat them. He said, is this the law in your book? Bring your book. Bring the Torah. Bring the Torah. He said, bring the Torah. So if he asks, bring the Torah. And we have faith that we must believe in the Torah. This is part of the religion of Islam. You must believe in the Torah. Can there be a hadith prohibiting you from reciting the Torah or reading the Torah as there is today? The hadith is in conflict with the Quran, of course. And when they recited from the Torah, of course, it became clear. The Torah said the punishment for adultery. I hope the Christians and Trinidad are listening to me. I hope Christians and Jews around the world are listening to me. The Torah said, that the punishment for adultery and fornication, sexual intercourse outside of marriage, whether it is premarital or extramarital, whether it is premarital or extramarital, the punishment is stoning to death. So when the Torah confirmed that was their law, but they said we have this law, then they had to explain, they say, well, you know, even the, when the small people committed adultery and fornication, we had to stone them to death. Or when the big fellas did it, we couldn't punish them like that. So this, we decided to institute a new law. And that is, for everybody, we'll just make their faces black and beat them. And therefore, they had stopped enforcing the law of punishment for several centuries. No one had ever seen someone being stoned to death in accordance with the Jewish law. And then when the prophet gave the order, put them to death by stoning, because that is your law. That is your law. That's the law the Christians and the Jews should be following to this day. They were astonished. Here was the prophet ordering the enforcement of the law in their book, which they were not themselves enforcing. And so here was evidence as dazzling as the sunshine. This man could not be other than the prophet of the one God, as he said he was. The Quran says they recognize him as a prophet the way they recognize their own sons. So then why? Why did they not accept him? Why did they not accept him as a prophet? And up to this day, they will not accept him. Answer? The answer is in this book here. The religion of Abraham and the state of Israel. This is one of my old, old books. The religion of Abraham and the state of Israel, a view from the Quran. You can order it from my bookstore, uh, Imran Hussein. Dot C O M. Imran Hussein.com is my online bookstore. If we accept him as a prophet, the implication is that our book, the Torah, is filled with lies. Because according to the Torah, it is only from Ishaq, Isaac, Ishaq alayhi salam. Only from his seed can there be prophets. Not from Ismail. No, no, no. The, the Torah had demonized Ismail, the son of Abraham, Ibrahim, Islam, as a wild, excuse my language, but it's there, a wild ass of a man. 
His hand against every man and every man's hand against him. That's what the Torah says about him. It's false. It's wrong. They put it in their own hands. So because the Torah says the covenant is with Ishaq or Isaac and not with Ishmael, no prophet could come from the seed of Ishmael. And Muhammad والسلام, is an Arab. He came from the seed of Ishmael. So he could not be a prophet. That's it. Full stop. So they could not accept him as a prophet. But more than that, they now conspire to destroy Islam. You can do what you want. We say to you and we say to the CIA and we say to ISIS, created by the CIA, you can do what you want. You will never succeed in destroying Islam. So they're attempting now to destroy Islam. And I told you what they were doing. And they're attempting to even assassinate him, the Prophet It was at this moment that Allah sent down the revelation. Changing the Qibla. This is your Qibla now. Their Qibla is in Jerusalem. This is your Qibla in Makkah. This is called Naskh, Mansukh, cancellation, no abrogation. This is the first example. He changed the Qibla or the direction for prayer. Then number two, he changed the law of fasting. That's your law of fasting. You must fast in accordance with that law. This is our law of fasting. And our law of fasting now is either better or similar, but not different. Either better or similar, but not different. Nas or mansukh, nasik and mansukh means an old law is cancelled or abrogated and the old law is replaced with a new law which is either better or similar, never different. So it is really foolish to find two verses which appear to be in contradiction with each other and to say, well, this one contradicts that one, therefore this one cancels that one. That is schoolboy scholarship. The law is, the new law is either better or similar to the old one, never different. And so now a new law of fasting. And the new law is you fast from dawn until sunset. And during the night you can eat, you can drink, you can have sexual relations during the night. But from dawn until sunset, you will fast. And you will continue fasting for one month of the year. Why does he send a new law at this time? Of new law of, of the direction of prayer, a new law of fasting. And it's about the same time that you have a new law of punishment for zina. Zina, as I said, is either fornication or adultery, that is premarital sexual relations or extramarital sexual relations, zina. And the new law cancels the old one. The old one is Raja stoning to death. And the new law is a public flogging or beating for premarital or extramarital sexual relations. So why does he do it now? Why not at that time in Makkah? Answer, because now a new religious community is born. A new ummah is born. And this ummah is going to face towards Makkah, the Kaaba. And this ummah has to be strong. It has to be consolidated. It has to be able to withstand attacks from all sides. And we now live in an age in which Islam is being attacked from every single different direction. And the fast of Ramadan is meant to protect you. So you will not follow them. 
but you'd follow this law which has come down, the truth which has come down in the Quran. And so the fast of Ramadan has come to deliver power to the Ummah, make us powerful, give us internal strength and cohesion. So we will not take our evidence, we will not take our guidance from the CNN or Al Jazeera or in Trinidad from a place called Mali Street. No. We take our guidance from the Quran and from the Hadith to the extent that the Hadith is in conformity or in harmony with the Quran. This is the month Ramadan, the second Ramadan in Medina, when we're going to have to fight as well. And so a new law comes down permitting us to fight. But never, never, never to use war as an instrument of promoting religion. That is a load of absolute rubbish with a capital R. Someone should throw it into the garbage bin. You do not wage war to promote your political agenda as the United States of America is doing and has been doing for 200 miserable years. You do not use war and fighting to promote an agenda in Jerusalem as they've been doing. No. You only fight to defend yourself when you are attacked. Or you fight to liberate the oppressed. When they, the oppressed, are calling on you and begging you to come to help them, to liberate them from oppression. The Ottoman Empire violated this law of Islam in waging bogus jihad against the Orthodox Christians for 600 years. A miserable expression of Islam from the Ottoman Empire, waging unjust war. And so we apologize to our Orthodox Christian brothers and sisters around the world, especially in Russia. Oh, yes, the Ottoman Empire fought endless wars on Russia. And now it's the Western world continuing that tradition, that ignoble tradition of waging endless wars on Russia. They wage war on Russia as well with the Bolshevik Revolution to destroy the Christian foundations, the spiritual heart of Russia. But their plan backfired. They even gave nuclear technology to the Soviet Union so that the Soviet Union will become the great, great, great empire that the Russian people will be deceived. I love it. Yeah. And now it's backfired because Russia is returning to her spiritual roots. As a Christian people where a man cannot marry another man and get a marriage certificate in a way you don't have this rubbish of legislation saying that a girl cannot be married before she's eight. 18 years of age, I say to you that that is a load of rubbish and it should be thrown into the garbage bin. We have a sacred law in Islam. And the Hindus have a sacred law as well. And perhaps the Hindus and the Muslims are the only people today with the Orthodox Christians defending the religious way of life. This is Islam. We fight only in response to aggression or to liberate the oppressed. When they, the oppressed, are calling on us and begging us to come and help them and liberate them from oppression. So Allah sent down the law, Kutiba alaykum al kital. Fighting is now made obligatory on you. And during that first Ramadan of fasting, we have to fight the Battle of Badr. So it's obvious that the fast of Ramadan came to deliver power. How does fasting deliver power? Power has an external dimension, which is your physical strength and uh, your weapons of war, etc. Your military training, that's the external dimension to power. But power also has an internal dimension. You need internal power as well, and I have addressed it in my book, 
fasting and power. Please read this book. Fasting and power. The month of Ramadan should make us more powerful, internally powerful. How does Ramadan deliver that internal power that you can defy the oppressor? Answer, when we fast, we fast for you. Asawmuli, says Allah, fasting is for me. And I will reward you for it. When you fast, you fast for me. So he's asking, all through Ramadan, if you fast for me, why can't you live for me? He said, no, I can't do that because if I do that, my business might collapse. I can't live for you because my business might collapse. I can't live for you because they call me a terrorist. I can't live for you because I get fired. I can't live for you because I won't get a promotion. I can't live for you, I might lose my friends. <laughs> yes, but Allah says, cool. Proclaim it, say it. Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. They don't like this verse of the Quran. Say it, verily my prayer and my service of sacrifice and my very living and my very dying, all is for you. You know what's the implication of that? When a people live for Allah, they will be ready to die for Allah. So be careful. Be careful. Be careful, we are telling you. Be careful. When a people live for Allah, they're prepared to die for Allah. So before you raise your hand, be careful. Before you open your mouth, be careful. When a people live for Allah, they're prepared to die for Allah. That's power. You can't destroy, you can kill him, but you cannot destroy him. You can kill a man, but you cannot kill the truth for which he stands and he lives for it and he'll die for it. That's power. And they're scared of that power. They'll do everything that they can to corrupt it and destroy it. How do we get that power? How does fasting deliver that power? Now I, link, I turn to the special part of today's lecture. The verses of the Quran dealing with the fast of Ramadan are in Surah Al-Baqarah, the second surah of the Quran. It is 183, 184, 185, and 187. Oh, what about 186? Shall I tell you what is 186? In 186, the subject is not fasting. Why not? وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي And when my servants question thee about me, Allah is saying, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Tell them, I am close. I am close. 